An orphan child, the wayward father, the homeless traveler in the rain. When life goes by and no one bothers, heaven feels the pain. Looking down, God sees each heartache, knows each sorrow, hears each cry, and looking up, will see compassion's fire ablaze in heaven's eyes. In heaven's eyes, there are no losers. In heaven's eyes, no hopeless cause. There's only people like you with feelings like me, amazed by the grace we can find. There's only people like you with feelings like me, amazed by the grace we can find in heaven's eyes. Thank you. Well, good evening, my friends, and welcome back to those who are in the, from the long haul. Uh, some have shared with me that this seminar is a little bit like drinking uh, water from a fire hydrant. Uh, there's a lot of information that we cover in a short period of time, uh, but tonight we are really going to go in depth, and we're going to cover uh, one of my favorite topics of all the scripture, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so just we're going to cover a few announcements, and then we're going to get right into the presentation. Uh, first of all, the Bible school. I noticed I was walking past out there, and I saw the uh, very high stack of the Bible study guides. You guys have been turning those in. I appreciate that. Uh, be sure, I'm told, that make sure your name is on them. There's not a place to write them on there, just on the back. There's a big white spot. Just write your name on there so that you can be sure to get back your study guides. And also check, I'm not sure where they're putting them, but to pick up your old study guides that are already graded. And it's not too late to start, so you, at any time you can turn in those study guides. You can always, um, and, and you're going to be getting a lot of them, okay? But they don't, they don't take a lot of time to do. Has anybody... Uh, is all, anybody caught up, completely caught up with the Bible study guides? Not tonight, but as of last night, several of you guys. Have you been blessed by them? Have they, have they helped you at all? Praise the Lord. So be sure to do the Bible study guides. Um, I will also say they are not going to be in order. So don't be shocked when you get some numbers that are out of order. That's okay. It's designed that way. Uh, this series that I, I usually do is actually longer than this. And so we're, what we're doing is we're trying to compact as much information into a shorter period of time. Now, I don't know if you would have signed up for uh, you know, a whole month-long series or sometimes five or six weeks long, but we're trying to compress all this down into about a three-week period, which means a lot more messages, a lot more studies, a lot shorter time. Um, also want to mention on the registration, um, some, some have not yet registered. If you have not registered, we're not forcing anybody to register, but we are encouraging you to because here in a little bit, 
we're going to be doing a drawing. And if you haven't registered, you're not in the drawing. And we have a lot of fun things we're going to be giving away in the seminar here. So I encourage you to please register. It also helps us get a name tag so I can see who you are. Uh, I'm getting to know some of your names already. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Prayer requests continue to, uh, we have a prayer, prayer request box out there in the foyer. We also have, that's also doubles as a Bible question box. So we're going to try to tackle questions night by night. Uh, as we do that, put them in the box. You can text them to me. My phone number is 573-260-5505. And then uh, we also are going to be able to, you know, if we, I don't have any questions from the box, we'll just take questions from the floor. Um, also, I want to encourage people to bring a friend. As uh, Pastor Jose uh, eloquently said, you've got seats next to you. Feel free to fill them. As such, uh, I'm promising as long as we have these, uh-oh, here they are. As long as we have them, we've got special giveaways for you and your friend. This is a nice postcard. It's uh, You just write a little note to somebody. You can send them. In fact, what my wife is, and she likes this picture so much, uh, that she actually puts a frame around it and puts it on the wall. Very nice for kind of a small space there. But uh, I promise to give one to you and to one to your friend as long as they last. So do I have an usher perhaps that can... Well, first of all, did anybody bring a friend? Let me ask that first. Anybody tonight bring somebody new? Maybe we don't have any to give away. You're new? She's bringing a lot of people. All right. Can I get an usher to come on up here? And uh, raise your hand up. Anybody else bring somebody new for the first time tonight? I want to make sure you get one. All right. There you go. All right. Give one to the person and then give one to the person they brought for the first time. Okay. Keep those hands up. And there you go. Got some more over here. Praise the Lord. And by the way, for those who are here for the first time, I want to say welcome to you guys. Uh, this is, I uh, hope to be a fun seminar. It's not just about uh, studying the Bible, which that's the main purpose of this but it's also about having enjoyment while we do it. So who else? Raise your hand up if you brought a friend. Make sure you and your friend gets one. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Also, a special drawing. I told you I have an app on my phone for a special drawing. Let me get it open here. And what we're giving away tonight, it's called A Cloud of Witnesses. It's a daily devotional uh, put out by Amazing Facts, and it's just a really, it says inspiring lessons from Bible characters. So 365 lessons in here goes through your Christian experience on a daily basis that will help grow, uh, grow you and bless you. So this is what I'm giving away tonight, and tonight is night number three, the appearing. Let me check who it's going to be. That's night four. Nobody's here for night four yet. So let me go back. Here it is. Night three. Marcel... Otino. Marcel, where are you at, brother? He's in the back back there? All right. Well, can you, I tell you what. If he's, would you be able to take this to him for me? Thank you very much. Okay. God bless you. Appreciate that. Excellent. The whole, he'll be surprised to, to get it. Excellent. All right. Well, a couple announcements, some uh, the program to come. So we're off tomorrow. So take a break, take a breather, but plan on coming back out Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., 6 p.m. if you want to come to the health program, uh, 7 p.m., the man of revelation, the man of revelation. Again, if you don't understand this topic, you're probably not going to understand much of the book of Revelation. And then on Wednesday, we're going to study the anatomy of evil. Let me say something about this presentation. If you know anybody who's an agnostic, an atheist even, somebody that really doubts the existence of God, or maybe they're asking big questions like, does God exist? Or why would God allow evil in the world? If God's so good, then why doesn't he just stop Satan from doing what he does? Why doesn't he stop all the, 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 the murders and the rapes of the world? If God is so good, why is the world so bad? We're going to look at that question uh, this next Wednesday. So please, that's the night to invite one of your friends out who maybe have, maybe, maybe you don't ask those questions. Maybe you know, you believe in God, that's enough for you. But there's a lot of people today who simply refuse to believe in a God who doesn't seem to care. 
Well, I got good news. We do have a God that does care, and I'm going to prove it to you on Wednesday. But we're actually going to do it from the Bible. We're going to do it actually from Bible prophecy. We're going to be looking in Revelation chapter 12 and also in Ezekiel and Isaiah to find out about this wonderful God that has been mischaracterized by Satan himself. I told you that we would be having a seminar motto each evening. So here's the seminar motto. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. So if that's a motto that, that, that you can just say, you know what, that makes sense to me, I believe that, then let's just go ahead and say that together. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. Amen. And as such, because this is a Bible prophecy seminar, I want to encourage you to grab uh, your Bibles. If you need a Bible, be sure to see one of the ushers. They will get you a Bible. Um, in fact, you can keep the Bible after coming for 10 days. It's yours. A really neat study Bible. Lots of charts and maps and graphs. We've got Bibles ready to come. Anybody need a Bible tonight? If you just need to borrow one, we have it back here. And we have pens available. If you need anything, you just see our registration table and we'll be glad to help you out. And be sure to take notes as well if you uh, would like to, because we're going to run through tonight's message fairly quick. My message this evening, the appearing, the appearing. Before we study this important topic, this topic that, uh, well, uh, there's been a lot of confusion about this topic. Before we study this, I think it's imperative, friends, that we pray. So would you bow your heads with me now as we talk to the Lord? Heavenly Father, we are going to look at a, a very controversial subject, but it shouldn't be. We're going to examine probably the most, one of the most important prophecies of all your holy word. And I pray, Father, tonight as we do that, that you would give us a, a humble heart of learning, of a student of your word. Bless us tonight as we study together in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 The appearing, my friends, what is it going to be like when Jesus comes back? Now, the second coming of Jesus is mentioned, get this now, 2,500 times in the Bible. Sometimes more allusions to it, but many times direct references to the glorious appearing of Jesus. Uh, some scholars have estimated that one out of every eight verses in the Bible deal with the subject of the coming of Jesus in the last days. And so what's really interesting with all this information in the Bible about the second coming of Christ, why is it that we have such a disagreement in the church about this topic? I mean, and you, and you know this as well as I, one person says one thing, another person says another thing, and there's such just a variety of ideas and opinions. You go to the bookstore and just all these different books, one say one thing, one say another thing, but what is it going to be like? How can we be sure that we are believing, reading, and understanding the truth? With all these different theories, how many of them can be right? right there's, there's, there's only one truth out there. Now, I'm not going to be so presumptuous to say I have it all figured out. What I will suggest to you is that if we were to take the Bible, I, I was shared this with somebody just the other night. I, I call it my desert island test. And what it is, uh, is if you were, let's say, in a plane uh, crash or something like that, and you pulled up on a uh, deserted island. It's just you. The only thing that survived was a Bible and yourself and maybe some food rations. And there you are on a deserted island waiting for rescue. Just so happened you were knocked unconscious and so you, you got amnesia. So you don't remember perhaps any books you read or anything like that, but you know how to read. So here you are on the deserted island with a clean memory. You're reading the Bible. That's all you have is the Bible. And without different teachers telling you what to believe, without different books making claims for this or that, with just the Bible, what conclusion would you come to? For me, that deserted island test really uh, puts into focus the need to stick with the Bible and the Bible alone. Um, I had sort of my own personal desert island test um, in my own personal experience when I was 15, I was incarcerated uh, after a pretty bad circumstance in drug rehab, and as I was coming out of Satanism and I was reading the Bible for the first time, I had no understanding of any religion really out there. Uh, I think my mom had a history of being involved with the Catholic Church, and then there was she went to a Baptist church when I was a young, and I, I just don't remember a whole lot of the details. I remember going to Sunday school, 
a few times, but I didn't have any knowledge really of religion other than what some Hollywood movies kind of portrayed religion as. That said, when I was reading through the Bible, after, and I decided to become a Christian reading the Bible, I was reading through it and I, I said, you know, I talk about the second coming of Jesus, and this is a pretty major event in, in, in history that's going to happen. I wanted to learn more about it. And so I studied and studied and studied and studied about what the second coming of Jesus was going to look like. And, you know, it, I kind of formed in my head what the Bible was saying. And then I got a radio. I began to listen to the local radio preachers. Not local radio preachers. There were some national radio preachers, but at local radio stations. As I did that, I realized that my ideas were quite different than what I was hearing on the radio. And I wonder why. We're all reading the same book, right? They're quoting Bible verses, and they're quoting Bible verses, and they're contradicting each other, and I'm, they're not, certainly not seeing it the way I'm seeing it. And so I'm just trying to figure this thing out. Praise God for God sending me a concordance. Uh, my mom, I told my mom I was a Christian. She was overjoyed. Now, she, didn't, she wasn't really a practicing Christian herself, but she knew being a Satanist was bad, being a Christian was good. So she was happy I was now a Christian. And so she went to the Christian bookstore, and she bought me a Strong's Concordance. I asked her later on, Mom, why did you buy, of all books on the bookshelf, why a Strong's Concordance? You know what she told me? She said it was the biggest book on the shelf. <laughs> that book, that concordance, that alphabetical Bible was for me a tool to help me study the Bible and get to know it so much better. But friends, I don't believe that the subject is vague. I don't believe that the subject of the second coming of Christ is something we cannot understand. I, tonight, I want to examine what the Bible says about this important topic. And um, we'll start here with what Jesus actually said about the second coming, about his own return to earth. And, there, and if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn now with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. You know, sometimes people forget that Jesus was also a prophet. Don't mistake me, he was the son of God, uh, the divine son of God. But he was also a prophet. God revealed to him future events. And those future events were designed to have us look into the future to find hope and encouragement. So look at what Jesus said as he talked about a future event, the most important future event that we can look forward to. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I like that part. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And he goes on to say, and where you know, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. So when Jesus returns, well, first of all, let me just say this. Why, why would Jesus want to come back? Right? When we read this passage, why do we see Jesus wanting to come back? He wants to be with you. Did you get that? He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Jesus is coming back to say, I want you to be part of my family. The second coming, people picture the second coming and the apocalypse and Armageddon and all these things. They picture it as some kind of doom and gloom and, and, and it, you know, doom, they call it doomsday. And it's just, it's always a bleak uh, vision of what it's going to look like. But friends, that, that's just not the case. According to what Jesus says here, I'm coming back so I can come get you. He wants to be with us. In fact, that's what his name was uh, given there in um, the book of Matthew. He, he, he says his name should be called Emmanuel. Meaning what? God with us. Jesus has always wanted to be with us. That's why we call him Emmanuel. So what should we expect when Jesus comes back? We, we just read it. Jesus says, I'm going to return. I'm going, I'm, first of all, I'm going to leave. I'm going into heaven, right? I'm going to put together some mansions for you. The many rooms, as some translation says, there's plenty of room in that city of God for you. Remember Abraham said, God has a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's what Abraham looked forward to. You read about that in Hebrews chapter 13. And so we know that Jesus is going to prepare a place, but he's going to come back and take us to that place. If you know the history of the Hebrews and, and marriages and how it works, there's a beautiful illustration there. I don't have time to get into it tonight, but powerful illustration. He's going to come back for his bride. We'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. What about the Apostle Paul? 
While he was in prison, I get this, the Apostle Paul was a faithful preacher of Jesus Christ, a wonderful missionary, and he stood for Jesus. And he did, I mean, I'm telling you what, this guy inspires me. Once a persecutor of Christians, now a follower of Jesus. But here at the end of his life, he's now in prison. It's the, the year is AD 63. And he's in Rome at the Mamertine prison. And while he's there, he's writing letters, kind of farewell letters, right? He says, my time is at hand, right? He's, he's basically saying, I'm, I'm done for, but there's a crown laid up for me. He wasn't giving up on hope. And actually, hope was the theme of his life. Look at what Paul wrote in a, in a letter to Titus right before he was executed. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says, looking for that blessed hope in the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is, a, this is a, a really important because if you ever find yourself in a dark place, maybe not a dungeon, maybe not a prison cell, but if you find yourself just in a place of depression and discouragement, a place where it looks, the future looks bleak to you, I want to tell you, friends, Look for Jesus, the second coming, because that, the Bible calls, our blessed hope. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 7, and something just happened to my computer. I'm not sure what it is. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, while I get my computer booted up, I'll just look it up here in my Bible and read it to you. So I have fought the good fight. 2 Timothy, let's see why, what happened here. There it is, it's all back for us. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved what? His appearing. You see what's going on here. Jesus was giving his disciples hope about the second coming. Now Paul is looking forward to that second coming. This is a theme of Christianity. This is not a, a sub-theme. It's not a minor theme. This is, what, what, this is the, 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 what all Christians should be looking forward to. That's why we need to figure this thing out. What is going to look like when Jesus comes back? I remember when we talked about this yesterday, when Jesus was talking in Matthew 24 about the signs of the times and, and, and with the, the, the nearness of Christ's coming. And he shows him these, uh, you know, shows him the temple and various different things. The first thing out of Jesus' lips when he was talking about the last days and the second coming is what? Let no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceives you. He says again in verse 5, he says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will what? Deceive many. Verse 24 says something very similar. It says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show, shall so. <laughs> That's kind of a tongue twister. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Satan is a deceiver. He does not want you to be ready when Jesus comes back. And so Satan, now, there's a couple ways he does this. First of all, he doesn't want you to be ready by getting you so caught up with the world and, and procrastinating and putting off a decision for Jesus that when he comes back, you're not ready. That's one way Satan tries to get you. But another way is, is, is he will also do, he'll be an imposter and he'll try to take the place of Christ and, and, and convince people that Jesus has returned. Actually, you see this happen throughout history, but we're going to even see it uh, more and more with supernatural healings and miracles and various different things to trick God's people. So the devil's going to use these false Christs and false prophets to confuse people about the second coming. So the way I believe that we're going to become grounded and avoid any kind of trap that the devil has set for us it's to really, we're going to look at some of the false teachings, but I think we need to be grounded by looking at the true. So let's look at some facts, some biblical teachings about the second coming that is just fundamental. And then from there, we're going to look at what that means for the different theories and ideas uh, roaming around about the second coming of Jesus. Let's look at the truths from God's Word about Christ's second coming. First, second, the second coming of Jesus is going to be literal. Literal. It's going to be an event in history, just like creation was a literal event, just like the birth of Jesus was a literal event, and the death of Jesus on the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. There's going to be a literal second coming of Jesus. Why am I saying this? Because there are some out there who teach that the second coming of Jesus is going to be not literal, but symbolic. Now, you might say, well, not, I never heard that, or maybe, I, listen, this is actually growing in popularity. People dismissing the teaching of the second coming of Christ as some kind of moral lesson that God wants us to learn, or maybe a scare tactic from God in heaven. 
It's not that. It is a real event that's going to happen. Hebrews 9, 28, and look unto them that look for him will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Let me make it clear. Jesus is going to appear. That's why tonight we're calling it the appearing. By the way, that's the opposite of some symbolic. There's no such thing as an appearing if, if, there's, if he's not actually showing up. He's going to appear to save us. Mark 13, 26. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. They're going to see it with their own eyes. Goes on to say, and then he will send his angels to gather together his elect from the four winds, from the furthest part of earth to the furthest part of heaven. So picture you picture it in your mind? God sending out his angels to gather together his elect. Are you one of God's elect? You know, you know by the way, there's a lot of confusion about this, and I'm not going to take the time to dig into this tonight. But here's how you know you can be part of God's elect. Here's how you can, it's very, very easy. You see, it's, it's like, it's like a, a, a political race where you got votes being cast. You see, God casts a vote for you. Satan casts a vote against you. But it's the majority wins. You've got the deciding vote. Whether you are the elect comes down to the decision that you make to choose God, to choose to be the elect. God elects those who choose Jesus. That's how you can be the elect, choose Jesus. All right, I didn't want to spend too long on that. Uh, the coming of Christ is a literal event. The question is tonight, are you ready for the literal coming of Jesus in the sky? Next, the second coming of Jesus, the second advent, is going to be a personal event. Now, I want to take you back to the first century. Jesus had died. He was resurrected from the dead. He went and preached. Does anybody remember how many days that Jesus preached? Or taught and shared and mingled among men after his resurrection? It was 40 days. 40 days. And then on that 40th day, something happened. I think it was a Thursday. Uh, Jesus was taken up. Here's what the Bible says in Acts 1, verse 9. Now, when these things, when he had spoken these things while they washed, he was what? Taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sign. And while they uh, Oh, there it is, going up a little bit. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, by the way, these two men, if you haven't caught it already, these are actually two holy angels of God, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand and gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You got what's going on here? He's going, he left in a very personal way. He's going to return in a very personal way. He left in the clouds. He is going to descend in the clouds. He ascended in a glorious, by the way, back going back to literal, a glorious literal body. He's going to come back in a glorious literal way, the same way that he left. This is also a very th important thing because, you know, he's, even though he's coming and he's, the angels are gathering you together, he doesn't stay back in heaven and send his angels and say, you know what, I'll, I'll just go, go get him and bring him back home. He comes himself. Jesus wants to be with you. Praise God. Friends, are you ready for the personal coming of Jesus Christ? I hope so. I hope your answer is yes. And if not, I, you know, right now, maybe by the end of this presentation, your answer will be yes. The second coming of Christ is also a visible event. It is a visible event. Now, I submit to you that there's nothing secret about the second coming of Christ. In fact, it's going to be a very bright event. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. I want you to picture that for a moment, the eyes of the old. The eyes of the young, the eyes of the rich, the eyes of the poor. Everybody, the, the, the free and the slave, everybody is going to see Jesus when he comes back. And again, that's why we use the word appearing. Here's another verse that uses the word appearing, Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. I'm just going to pause for just a second. Why would all the tribes of the earth be mourning when they see Jesus? 
they weren't ready. When Jesus comes back, is that going to be a day of mourning for you or a day of celebration? Well, praise the Lord. Celebration indeed. It goes on to say, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with heaven, uh, clouds of heaven with power and great glory. A side note about the word clouds. Almost every time you see the talking about the second coming of Jesus, and you talk read about clouds, almost every time the clouds are actually referring to angels. Clouds are a symbol of angels. You see it when Jesus was ascending up into the clouds. He was ascending up among the angels. Matter of fact, they saw two of them there that day. Here he's coming with the clouds of heaven. Well, it tells us elsewhere he's coming with all the angels of heaven. We're going to read in just a few nights. We're going to be looking in Daniel chapter 7 where we see the, 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 the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. He's coming with the clouds to the Ancient of Days. Anyway, that's, we'll talk about that later on. But that's the angels as it describes them there. So Jesus Christ is coming back. It's going to be a visible event. Are you ready for the visible coming of Jesus Christ? And i got to emphasize this, especially on all, all these points, literal, personal, and visible. Think about this. There are certain churches out there. I won't name them by name, but there are certain ones that go around knocking on doors and various different things. And they'll tell you that Jesus already came. That Jesus returned back in the early 1900s. And that Satan has been bound. And I say to, I, look, I tell him, I say, okay, look around. Does it look like Satan has been bound? Look around. Does it look like Jesus is here? I think you read a different Bible than I do. And in fact, they actually made their own Bible. So that's you know, a different story. Won't get off into that. The point is, is that Jesus is going to come back in a very literal way, very personal way, a very visible way. And I'm going to, I, I, and there's more than just this list of four. In fact, on your notes when you leave tonight, I'll have about six things that you're going to be able to see. But the his second coming is also going to be an audible event. An audible event. Not only will every eye see it, but every ear will hear the coming of Jesus Christ. Here it is, Revelation 16, verse 18, as it describes this incredible event. He says, and there was noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Wow. Can you imagine being in? I'll just ask, has anybody ever been in an earthquake before? You've been in one before? Was it, was it a loud event where things crashing around you, or is it just kind of small? Just kind of small. But I, I've got some friends from California, and I'll tell you what, some of them have been the great shaking events. And I'm telling you, they, it's, it's described. But can you Described as a loud event, but can you imagine everything shaking? So much so that I was showing this picture here. I guess I don't have it on my screen, but I had I have another picture of uh, the. Um, it's an illustration of that, that bridge in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. Is that the Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco? Yeah, and how it was being basically falling into the sea. And I did a meeting just outside San Francisco one time, a little town called Novato, and they were like. <gasps> Like, what are you gasping about? They were seeing the San Francisco Bridge, that the Gold Gate Bridge, falling into the, the bay there. And I just, uh, you know, can you imagine being in the most massive earthquake the earth has ever seen? I mean, last night we looked at how earthquakes are increasing over time. We saw the massive earthquakes. I mean, uh, one of your study guides from last night talked about the Lisbon uh, earthquake, probably a 9.5 or so. Richter scale, we saw the one in 2004. This is going to be off the charts. This is the event we're going to see. Lightnings, thunderings, thunderings. That's very, in fact, did anybody hear some thunder last night? Um, I'm, I, I actually a pastor a church just down in, uh, just on the, this side of Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, there's an event down there they call Thunder Over Louisville. Anybody ever heard of Thunder Over Louisville? I didn't know about it until I moved to Indi Indiana. But <laughs> anyway, apparently all these planes are flying over, loud planes. And uh, anyway, I thundered the thunder last night. I've never heard a plane that loud. Literally, the light, the lightning struck so close. It was so loud. The, uh, we're standing in an RV. The whole RV shook. It's going to be even more loud than that. Mighty, a great earthquake. And this says every island fled away. The mountains were not found. Loud. Now watch this. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. You guys are very familiar with this. And this is an important one to understand tonight because and we're going to look at it a little bit more in depth later on. This is the Bible verse that 
most people who talk about the second coming of Christ go right to. This is the one that most people are familiar with. So let's look at it a little bit tonight. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? Shout with the voice of the archangel. And get this one, guys. With the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. You know, I have God. When I went to Israel, I brought back a couple of shofars. This is one of them I brought back. This is one of the trumpets they would use in Bible times. And, and uh, my wife and kids, we all like to blow the shofar. We're getting better at it. I'll blow it just real briefly here. Okay? Let's see. All right? Just give you a taste of it. That's a trumpet of me. Can you imagine what the trumpet of God sounds like? I'm telling you what, I can't imagine it. The trumpet, of man, the trumpet of God is going to blow enough that the dead will rise. It goes on to say, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up. That word caught up, we're going to come back to that now. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In fact, you know, you, the word rapture, this is it. This is it right there. The word caught up right there. Harpazo in the, in, in the Greek. That's it. Rapture. So when you picture the rapture, this is the verse that's happening. And friends, I want you to notice that the rapture is a loud event. Did you catch that? We'll come back to this here in a little bit. But it goes on to say, And thus shall we also always rather be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These are comforting words. Words. In fact, when you ever go to a funeral and you want to comfort somebody, especially believers, you can give them this. This is a hope-filled passage. The dead in Christ will do what? Arise first. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Caught up together. Christ's coming is going to be an audible event, a loud event. So here you have it. It's going to be literal, personal, visible, audible. And you can add glorious, you can add it's going to be a final event after the second coming of Christ. There's no more chances, no more uh, redemption opportunities. But again, as I mentioned before, for every truth of God, Satan has a counterfeit. For every truth of God, Satan has a counterfeit. But how do we know if we're being deceived or not? I'm going to admit that it's tough. It's a lot like being asleep. How do you know that you're sleeping when you're asleep? <laughs> you know, how do you know that you were sleeping when you wake up? Being deceived is a lot like sleep. You, you, while you're actually in deception, you don't think you're in deception. It's only when you're undeceived that you realize, I was deceived. But how many of us are willing just to say, God in heaven, God of truth, Reveal to me whether or not I am deceived. That's a bold prayer. You might find that God will lift the scales from your eyes like he did from the Apostle Paul. Remember before the Apostle Paul? He was Saul. Was he, was he deceived? He thought he was doing the right thing in persecuting Christians, hauling them off to jail, even being responsible for some of their deaths. And yet God interceded and revealed to the Apostle Paul, revealed then to the, the uh, persecutor Saul, that he was deceived. Friends, we need to make sure that we are not deceived. And by the way, you know how, uh, I guess this is how they did it in the movies. They said, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're sleeping and you want to wake up, you got to pinch yourself while you're sleeping to find out if you're really sleeping. And if you are sleeping, it'll wake you up. You know how we pinch ourselves to make sure we're awake? This book. <laughs> this book. You, this is your pinch that will help you examine whether or not you're being deceived. Now, there are different theories about the last day events. The most popular one that's out there right now, you're very familiar with it, I'm sure you are, is the Left Behind series. This is uh, sort of made famous back in a, uh, not the Nicolas Cage movie, but another movie that uh, I think it was Kirk Cameron did uh, many years ago. But that actually came as a result of a book series that was written by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. And uh, Tim LaHaye, he was... He's more of the scholar. Jerry Jenkins, he's more of the, of the writer. And together they teamed up to create this end time scenario. Until this book series was published, this, the, the teaching of what they would call the secret rapture 
really wasn't super popular. It, you know, late Great Planet Earth uh, came out before that. You had uh, a few different commentaries that would that promoted this. But this series, when it came out, became such I mean, a multi-million dollar uh, book deal. Um, in fact, they were they were listed, as I understand it, uh, in like the first four places on the U.S. Uh, or the New York Times bestseller list all at the same time at one time in history. And that's considering that book, the Christian bookstores weren't even taken into account in the counting. That's how popular these books were. In this left behind uh, scenario, what you have is Jesus comes for believers. The believers are taken up into heaven, snatched up. And then for a seven year period on earth, the Antichrist reigns. And then, and then there's a lot of details that happens there. At the end of the seven year period, uh, those that are converted during that time and the Jews and others, Jesus comes back again to take them to heaven. And, uh, and so this idea, or sometimes they, the theory is that it leaves them on earth, right, for, another, for a thousand years. So this idea uh, is, is probably the prevailing idea out there. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and that here in just a moment. But there's a problem with this scenario, and it's not a problem that I've just recognized, but actually the author of, the co-author of that Left Behind series book, Tim LaHaye, uh, he was challenged by Bible scholars and said, hey, you know, this, this whole book series is built upon the premise of poof, the Christians are gone, the rapture happens, life goes on, the second coming happens, right? After that, which would almost be like as a third coming. Well, when he was challenged on that, he wrote this book called No Fear of the Storm. And here's what he wrote in that book, page 69. He said, one objection to the pre-tribulation rapture, means that the a rapture that happens before the tribulation, is that not one passage of Scripture teaches the two aspects of his second coming separated by the tribulation. This is true. So here the author of this novel series, made millions of dollars on it, is admitting there's a problem. There's no Bible verse supporting it. He doubles down on page 188 by saying no single verse specifically states Christ will come before the tribulation. Now, the way they get around that is they say, well, there's this verse here, here, and here, and here, and if you read it this certain way, then you can come to this conclusion. But the problem is if you're just reading the Bible clearly just for what it says, and, you, and you, we just read a, many of the major verses about the second coming there from John chapter uh, 14, Titus chapter 2, we've looked at other passages, in all those different places we've noticed it just talks about one single event. And so he's saying, look, I'm dealing with this. I've got to admit, I can't find the verse. I'll share with you a story here in a little bit that kind of illustrates that. So is this what's going to happen? Is, is, is the rapture going to be a secret event or a glorious event? Is the rapture going to be, and again, I, whatever it is that you've held on to and believed and, and studied and come to a conclusion of, I'm not here to, 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 to really, you know, fight and debate. I just want to share an idea that I feel is consistent with God's word for you to chew on, okay? Because we want to make sure that we are not going to be deceived in these last days. So what about this pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? So just to clarify the terms, there was the, the, the most common belief today is a pre-tribulation rapture. So Jesus comes before a time of tribulation, Okay, mid-trib, they're the ones who find the Bible verses that talk about the 1260 days and the three and a half years, and they see that there's like half of a seven-year period. So they say, well, Jesus is going to come halfway through a seven-year tribulation. Then you've got a third group of people. They're called the post-tribs, and they're the ones that believe that there's going to be a time of tribulation on earth, and Jesus is going to come at the end of that tribulation time, right? So that the glorious, of, glorious coming of Christ is the same thing as the rapture. They call it the real rapture. So you've got the three major views. And listen, there's, and there's I can't even count how many variances of those views along the way and events that are going to happen. But this broadly examines them. But here's, and you're going to ask me, well, what, 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 what position do you take? In fact, somebody asked me last night, well, where do you stand on this? Well, um, I, do, I, I would lean on a personal level toward the post-tribulation view. I do have a problem, though. There's a teaching about a seven years of tribulation. I've read the book of Revelation many times. Love it. Studied it. I have yet to find seven years of tribulation in the book of Revelation. 
Um, in fact, I can't find seven years of tribulation anywhere in the Bible. You can read, what, what you, in the book of Revelation, you have the seven last plagues that come on earth, and those seven last plagues, it says those plagues come in one day, right? And even if the day is prophetically a year, which we'll talk about later on, that's still not seven years, it's a short period of time. So we have to be careful to, to, to not just take a, um, a generally thought position that's true and just hold on to it and assume it's true and build a lot of things on it. We've got to examine it at its root. But one problem with this, and this is the reason we have various different teachings about the end times. Actually, I'm going to give you a little history lesson. It dates back to the Dark Ages. Do you know the, re the reason the Dark Ages were dark? They didn't have the light of God's Word. In fact, the Bible was banned. And do you know who banned the Bible? The Christian church. <laughs> Literally, it was Christians who said, don't read the Bible, trust the priests. Trust the, trust the religious leaders. They've got the authority. Don't read the Bible for yourself. We've got it all figured out. But the problem was, is during the Dark Ages, there was something called the Protestant Reformation. And people started waking up and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. They began to get the Bible in their own hands. Uh, one priest, his name was Martin Luther. He was actually reading the Bible in Latin. That was the language he knew. He was in the, in the library there. He wasn't even supposed to be doing it, but he was reading it. And he's like, whoa, the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. Amazing. He started teaching that and got kicked out of the church. They tried to kill him. You know, and that's, and that's, that's a teaching we all should believe today. We're saved by grace through faith. Amen? Uh, not by our works, but by the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, that said, the, the church started waking up and saying, wait, we've, we're learning all these things. And a lot of people are leaving the church by droves. And so they said, what are we going to do? And what they did was they got a council together and said, let's figure this thing out. And what they came across was two really smart guys. They said, the, the first smart guy, his name was Alcazar. This was in the 1500s. Alcazar, he decided, you know what? Let's tell the people that all the end time prophecies, all, all, because right, what they were doing, the Christians were reading their Bibles, they were saying, hey, this is pointing to the church as a problem. And the Alcazar said, no, 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 here's what we're going to do. We're going to teach the people that all these prophecies related to the early centuries. All of this happened early on. Nero was the Antichrist. And, 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 and so all the, all the prophecies related to the first century. And you know what? The people said, that's a good idea. That was, that's going to get the attention off of us and on the early church. So that's what they did. It was, you know. But then a, another scholar came by. He was a, he was a cardinal. Ribera. Ribera said, no, no, no. This is what's really going to work. He said, let's just tell them that the second coming or not the second coming particularly, but the end time scenarios uh, that most people are reading about, we're going to tell them that actually happens at the very end of time. That, that everything's going to happen in one big burst right in the last days. And when that happens, uh, be before that happens, there's no focus or attention on us as a church. And so what you have is this, the, what was born was the idea of preterism and the idea of futurism. One idea that all the prophecies are majorly fulfilled in the first century, and one idea that all the prophecies are majorly fulfilled in the very last days. What was cast to the curb was a teaching called historicism. Historicism is what all the Protestants were teaching in those days, saying basically that God fulfills prophecy throughout history. That's why they call it historicism. From the time of the prophet to the time of the end, God unveils prophecy. So when they were reading the book of Revelation, for example, and they would read about the seven churches, they would see those seven churches as seven ages through the church, leading you know, from the first church, the pure church of Ephesus, all the way to the church of Laodicea, the church of judgment, the last day church. So you saw this, this progression throughout history, reading through those prophecies. They saw the same thing in the seven trumpets. They saw the same thing in the seven seals. And so you know, that's the way they looked at things. But all of a sudden, they're being told, no, 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 no. All the prophecies are in the future. All the prophecies are in the past. Well, this is actually didn't catch on very well until uh, John Darby and a few others started, and within Protestant circles, started teaching futurism. When the Schofield Reference Bible came out, it had some footnotes in there about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that talked about all these events happening so far you know, uh, in the future. And, and that's what really brought this idea about the secret rapture idea. Before then, it wasn't really taught too much. I mean, there were some ladies who had some visions. I think Margaret McDonald was one of them. She supposedly was, had this vision about the secret rapture. And so people said, well, she's, she had a vision. It has to be true. 
But again, they couldn't find that one Bible verse. Here's how they would teach it. They would see that basically uh, the Old Testament prophecies like prophets, prophets like Daniel, they couldn't see the New Testament church, but they could see the cross and they could see that the last seven years of earth's history, but they couldn't see the church. And so you and I basically were hidden from view. This is kind of the, the, the view that they had uh, then. And so uh, that took off the heat off the church during the dark ages, this, this teaching. And it wasn't really... Again, it wasn't even debated until the late 1800s or so. Let me tell you about Dr. Roland Bingham. This man, he was a, a once editor of Christianity Today and also a missionary. I think it was in, was it Burma? No, it was Sudan. He was a missionary in Sudan. Incredible uh, life story of this guy. But anyway, uh, Dr. Roland, there's a story told about him when he was writing his sermon uh, late one Saturday night and uh, his, his wife suddenly asked him a question. And she says to him, uh, husband, <laughs> she says, I'm teaching Sunday school in the morning and uh, we're going to be talking about the second coming. And I'm looking for that verse where Jesus comes back and secretly steals away all the believers. Do you know where that's at? So Dr. Roland said, that's easy. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So she went away and she began to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go ahead and read that verse together. Again, the passage that he was referring to. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so she's reading these Bible verses, right? And that didn't seem to be right to her. So she went back and said, honey, I was asking for the, I was asking for the quiet secret rapture, and you gave me the noisiest verse in the Bible. Now listen to how Dr. Roland Bingham responded. He said, in sheer desperation, I took out my Bible and threw myself helplessly on the Lord. The weeks that followed, that innocent query and the trouble in which, to which it landed me is a separate story. Now listen closely, guys. If you hold the theory of a secret rapture of the church, try out that simple question on yourself. Wow. Wow. It's a challenge. And so this process that he went through has woken up a lot of Christians to the same thing, to say, what am I missing? Am I just, you know, just ignoring what the Bible says to, to be sure I'm towing the line when it comes to what's popular out there? And, and let me ask this question. This is a personal question. I'm going to go back to this verse here. It says here, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice, with the trumpet. Okay? It says... And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive and remain should be caught up. So here's a question. When are we caught up? When, again, that's the word for rapture. When are we caught up? Before the shout or after the shout? After the shout. When are we caught up? Before the voice or after the voice of the archangel? After the voice of the archangel. One more. When are we raptured? Before the trumpet or after the trumpet of God? After the trumpet of God. So when you ask yourself, what does 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 teach about the rapture? Again, there's no doubt about it. It teaches a rapture. There's going to be a catching up. You can't, you can't avoid that. Maybe you don't like the word rapture, but it's right there in the Bible. The question is, when is it going to happen? Friends, it's very clear that it happens, the rapture happens at the very coming of Jesus together with the shout, with the voice, with the trumpet, okay? There's no, there's just nothing there that would imply that there's a secret nature to this at all. All right, let me get back to where I was going there. Here's how Paul read it. We read this earlier. Here's how Paul wrote it to Titus. He said, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul looked forward not to a rapture, a secret rapture. He looked forward to a glorious appearing, that's the time when the righteous are going to be resurrected from the dead. And by the way, when are the righteous caught up with the dead? The same time. The righteous living and the righteous dead are caught up at the same time. So Paul doesn't call it secret. He calls it glorious. But again, this is just what we would expect. Satan is going to try to trick people about the second coming so that they would not be prepared. In fact, they would be, because, and listen, 
if we misunderstand the details about the second coming of Christ, I don't think we're going to be lost because of that. No, I don't think God's going to condemn them. Sorry, you did not have the timeline perfectly laid out. You're, you're, just, you're, you're going to be doomed. That's not what God is like. But the danger of believing something false could lead us to be unprepared. It can lead us to put off a decision. You see, error is never harmless. I don't think we're going to be condemned necessarily for believing error in this regard, but it can lead us to condemnation if we, don't, if, if we believe something false and that leads us to make a bad decision. Again, going back to what Jesus said, it says, Then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Now, let's talk about this for just a second. Jesus is going to come in such a way that people are going to know that he's here. So if somebody's walking around on this earth, if their feet are walking on this planet, lo, here is Christ, or there, he says what? Do not believe it. So if you hear on the news tonight, somebody says, well, Jesus is, is back. You didn't hear about that? Oh, yeah, he's, he's over here teaching. Jesus' first words is, do not believe it. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets that shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible... They shall deceive the very elect. He goes on to say, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say to you, Behold, he's in the desert. Let's just say, you know, Jesus is out in Utah right now. He says, what? Go not forth. I would even recommend, if it's on CNN, like they're doing a live interview for Jesus, go not forth. Do not turn it on. The devil's slick. You think you're smarter than the devil. That's just not true. That's why we got to cling to Jesus, who is smarter than the devil. Amen? They say, when the devil comes knocking, you go have Jesus get the door. <laughs> behold, he's in the desert. Behold, go not forth. It says, behold, he's in the secret chambers. Do what? Why would Jesus use this phrase to talk about what people are going to teach about the second coming? He's in the secret chambers? Could he be warning us about a secret rapture teaching? And then he describes what the second coming is actually going to look like. He said, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus says the second coming is going to be like lightning. Now, as I mentioned last night, we had some bright lightning, some loud thunder. Nobody's going to miss the second coming of Christ. There's going to be deceptions of persons, places, and manners. And of all those, Jesus says, believe it not. If they tell you it's secret, don't believe it. Jesus gives no hint that his return will be secret. Instead, he declares emphatically that it will be as the lightning and solemnly warns us about deceptions. So this idea about a seven-year tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist during that time. In fact, you know what? I wasn't going to do this tonight. I'm just going to share with you one Bible verse that I think is just going to blow this out of the water. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm keeping an eye on my time. I'm going to run through this real fast. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You've got to see this with your own eyes, okay? This is right here in the Scriptures. It tells us unequivocally, certainly, without a single doubt, what it's going to look like before Jesus comes. What's going to ha what, what has to happen before Jesus appears, okay? You're with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. This is the second book in the T section of your Bible. You ever notice that? First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. Five T books all together. Okay. Verse one. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Okay, just to establish context, are we talking about the second coming of Jesus? Yes, because the first coming had already happened. So this is definitely the second appearing of Jesus. And then our gathering, what's it talking about? That's the rapture. Our gathering is us going to be with him. Okay, it says, are gathered together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as from us, as though the day of Christ had come. He says, don't think that Jesus had already come. He hadn't. Watch. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What's this telling you? By the way, we're going to have a whole night dedicated to identifying the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation 13, the little horn of Daniel 7. We're going to look at that later on in the seminar. We're going to know who the Antichrist is. But right here, wh whoever it is, it says will be exposed first before the second coming happens. 
In fact, he, used to, he even uses the word, he says, don't be deceived. He knows that Satan is going to be tricking on this very important point. So he says, don't be deceived, that there will not be a rise of the Antichrist before the second, or after the second coming of Jesus. It's going to happen before Jesus comes. So there we have it, friends. This is a delusion. When we're asking ourselves what to believe, we're going to ask, we have to ask, are we going to believe the Bible or a fiction book series? I said, but it's based on the truth. Well, it's not based on the truth of God's word. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 tells us that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, the devil never comes and says, hey, I'm the devil. I'm here to deceive you. And he doesn't do that. He never knocks on your door and says, hey, I'm going to try to tempt you today. No, he comes subtly. He comes as an angel of light. And this is important, friends, because Satan is going to impersonate Christ. And how do we know the truth from the false? Well, I'm going to take you back to verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4, because it says we're going to be caught up when Jesus comes. So use your imagination and visualize Jesus is coming in the clouds, right? which means all the holy angels. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. All of a sudden, our feet lift up off the ground. And we're going to be where? With Jesus, as he says in John 14. I'm going to come. So that you can be with me where I am. He's coming to take us to be back with him. If we, and here, here's, this is why this is important. We're going up when Jesus comes. If we see a Jesus with his feet on the ground, it's not the Jesus. It's not Jesus Christ. It's not our Lord and Savior. It is a counterfeit. It is an antichrist. It is a false Christ. Okay? So it's very important to understand the difference. Jesus' feet does not touch the earth when he comes a second time. There will be a time later on when his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. That's after a thousand years. We'll talk about that when we talk about the millennium. So let's, look, let's review what the Bible talks about when it talks about the second coming. It's going to be literal, personal, visible, and audible. Does the secret rapture teaching, which is the main teaching out there, does it fit within that scenario? I just submit that there's no way it can fit. Now, I, again, I may be missing something. You can share something with me, I, I, perhaps. But I tell you, I have dug and dug and searched and searched to try to figure out. And it's just it's abundantly clear to me, as clear as daylight, that this idea of a pre-tribulation rapture is as well-meaning as, as certain Christians are in teaching it. It actually puts Christians in a very difficult place because they are expecting to escape the trials and the tribulations to come. They think that all of a sudden, there's going to be a whole group of people on earth who are going to wake up and get the, the morning paper, multitudes missing. Christ returns. You know, can you imagine sitting reading a magazine? Jesus returned. You know, all these people, all these Christians disappeared. Poof! They're gone. And I was left behind. But here's the danger of that thought. A lot of people believe they're not going to be here. They're not going to be here during that time, so why prepare for it? Why prepare for it? And so a lot of people are going to be unprepared for the crisis which is coming on the earth. Friends, we've got to be prepared. Now let's just say I'm wrong. Let's just say there's going to be a secret rapture, proof Christians are gone. Life goes on. Well, by God's grace, I'm going to be one of those Christians. And, I, and I've lost nothing. But let's say I'm right. And let's say Jesus... There is no secret rapture. There's no second chance. There's no time of tribulation where you can get your act together. I, I uh, remember the book series, Left Behind, and, and after they're all, all the Christians are raptured up, people are looking around like, where's so-and-so? Where's so-and-so? And, oh, the rapture must have happened. Oh, we must get our life right. There's no, if there, yeah, no second chances. The Bible says, uh, in fact, I'll just read it to you right here. I don't think it's in my notes, so I'm just going to read it. It's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, last verse. It says... Well, backing up right before the last verse, uh, if I can find it here. Uh, so Christ was offered once to bear the sin of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, will he appear a second time apart from sin for salvation? He's coming back a second time for the purpose of salvation. If you do not, if you're not ready at the second coming, there's no salvation for you. That's the reason Jesus died. He died so you can be ready for that time when he comes back so you can be with him forever. Now, I do have to cover a couple of questions because there's a lot of people who ask, well, what about Jesus coming back as a thief? Doesn't the Bible say he comes as a thief in the night? 
In fact, it does say that. What does it mean that Christ would come back as a thief? Well, let me suggest to you that His coming as a thief refers not to how He comes, but to when He comes. He's not saying that He's going to sneak in quietly and take His people and sneak out. No, it's more like a home invasion. He's kicking the door down, right? He's getting His people and what's left behind is what's destroyed. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's really, it's going to be a surprise. The, the thief concept is that, that there's people who are not ready. They're not watching. They're not waiting. Let's look at the Bible verses that talk about it and see if it talks about some kind of secret event. Look at this, guys. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2. He says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a what? Thief in the night. So he talked about the day of the Lord. It's the second coming of Jesus. It comes like a thief in the night. But many people stop reading there. Let's not stop reading. Verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as tra travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So the night that Jesus comes as a thief, they're saying it's all well, peace and safety. But what happens? Sudden destruction comes upon them. Does it leave the impression that all is well afterward? That life goes on afterward? Not at all. He says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that they should overtake you as a thief. So the truth is, if you're a Christian, he's not coming as a thief for you. If you're a Christian, he's coming as a thief only for those who are not. You're awake, you're watching, you're ready. That's not the only verse that talks about coming as a thief. 2 Peter chapter 3, I don't know why it's given past it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It says exactly the same thing we just read. And it says, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So tell me, is Jesus coming back as a thief in the night? Yes. What happens to the earth and the world when that happens? It's destroyed. How are you going to survive that? How do you have seven years of tribulation if the earth is melting with a great heat, a fervent heat? Friends, this is going to be the end of the world. As we know, I shouldn't have said that. You, <laughs> too many people know that. Um, the second coming of Christ, friends, is going to... Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rescue his people from this planet. But I've got bad news for everybody who's not ready in that day. It's good news for those who are ready. Amen? Look at what happens um, to our bodies. This is kind of a side note. What happens to our bodies when Jesus comes again? 1 Thessalonians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. By the way, let's talk about the trumpet for just a second. When is that trumpet blown? At the same time of the shout, right? The same time... The, uh, uh, the voice of the archangel, it happens at, like you said, the rapture. That's the trumpet. And look what happens to the trumpet. It says, for the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The resurrection of the dead is going to happen when the trumpet blows. All the righteous dead who've ever lived, all the righteous living who've ever lived are going to be together with Jesus that day. First Thessalonians, you know, I'm going to go back to this just for a second, because I'm thinking, in my mind... When the, when the rapture happens, Jesus is coming back. He, I mean, we are going to be caught. The, think about it. The dead in Christ raised up. You're going to see the loved ones who, who fell asleep in Jesus, right? And you're going to be caught up together with them in the air. And together, we're going to be one family, one church. Amen? He says, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. This is great news, especially if you suffer from any pains. As last week, I... I hurt my back. I don't even know what I did. I tweaked it somehow, and I was, I was like on a 9 out of 10 of the pain level, right? And I know so, I'm now down to like a 2 on my pain level. I feel pretty good. You know, it was pretty rough last night sleeping, but, you know, I'm doing a little bit better. I know some people who live constantly under pain. You know, or you get older, and you start feeling the, the, the effects of age. You know, you've been down to tie your shoe, and you say, you know, what else can I do when I'm down there? You know, you're just... You're, 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 you're getting old. And you say, I'm ready to trade this in on a newer model. God's going to do that. He's going to give you a new body, an incorruptible body. Praise the Lord. That he get, he's going to take all the aches and pains away. Now, what about the Bible verse that says, one will be taken, the other left? This is, I think, the number one Bible verse that's used to support a secret rapture teaching. And I admit, if, you, if you've heard the secret rapture teaching your whole life, this is all you know. All right, not sure what's happening there. I guess he, one was taken. There we go. Ready? 
Okay. You know, maybe my plug isn't in tight. I'll, I'll just check my my connections here. Hopefully, it'll it'll fix up. Let's try this. My computer's flashing at me. Okay. Well, one, you know what? Let's go ahead. If you got a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 17. That's where you find the story of one taken and one left. And uh, we're going to look at that real quick here because we're going to ask ourselves the question. There it is. Um, we're going to ask ourselves the question about uh, what does it mean that one is taken? What does it mean that one is left? Oh, did you see that? Out there in the field working, right? There it is. I'll show you again. Right? Ready? Boom. You guys see that? One taken, one left. What does that mean according to the Bible? Or is one left alive? Luke chapter 17, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. So Jesus is comparing it to the days of Noah. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given to marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and what? Destroyed them all. So you have one group of people that was saved and one group of people that was lost. Or what does the Bible say happened to them? They were destroyed. Okay, so this is, this is Noah's day. One group saved, one, one group lost. Watch this. Verse 28. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and did what? Destroyed them all. Now, remember, he's comparing it to the days of the Son of, Son of Man. In fact, he says it in the next verse. He says, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The word revealed is the same thing as appeared. Uh, I think it's parousia in the Greek. It's just, it's the appearing. When Jesus appears, a picture, he's coming in the sky. Like it was in Noah's day, like it was in Lot's day. One group is saved, one group is lost and destroyed. Verse 34, I tell you that in that night there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together at the mill, or grinding together rather, and one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Now the question is, where? And the answer said to him, where, Lord? Here was, was Jesus. Saying, you ready for this? This was the simple answer of Jesus. Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. What do you think the eagles are doing? <laughs> you got that right. They were eating. They were feasting. In fact, in the book of Revelation, you have two suppers. You have the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the one you want to be at. And Revelation 19 talks about the supper of the great God. Don't be at that supper. That's the supper where the birds feast on the flesh of the mighty men and the, and the rich men and the captains and the poor. Basically, all the wicked is the, you know, you don't want to be at that supper when the birds are feasting. That's what's happening here. Where the body is. In fact, that word body is the word soma. It's talking about a dead body. Wherever the eagles will be gathered together. When Jesus Christ comes, those who aren't going with him to heaven are going to be left on this earth and they are going to be bird food. Not a seven year tribulation, not life going on, not an antichrist coming on. The antichrist will have been exposed and revealed already at that time. In fact, that's how I know that the antichrist is already alive right now. I can't wait to tell you about it. Noah got on the ark, he was saved. Those who did not get on the ark were destroyed. Lot was drug out of the city by the angels, praise the Lord, he was saved. Those who stood behind or looked back in the case of Lot's wife was destroyed. When Jesus comes back, those who are alive and are ready, they'll be taken to be with Jesus. Those who are alive and are not ready will be destroyed. I don't know how to emphasize this anymore. When I read the Scriptures, I cannot find a second chance. I can't find a, a, a teaching or a doctrine or, or, or a theory of a secret rapture. It's just not in there. You don't want to be food for angels, or for, for uh, birds, rather. Not, certainly not for angels. Uh, eagles is what I was trying to say. Eagles. That would be kind of weird. Um, Revelation 6, verse 15. Let me turn my brightness down here. My computer's about to die for some reason. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, it says, They hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Hide us, right? Or fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Are you getting what's going on here? 
<laughs> they're asking God to, 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 to you know, they're, they're basically crying out to the rocks and the mountains, fallen as highest from the face of God, highest from the face of the Lamb. The great day of His wrath is coming. Who shall be able to stand? When Jesus comes back, the wrath of the Lamb is going to happen. And if you're not ready, friends, you're going to cry out to the mountains to fall on you. I want to tell you, God is good. God is good. God is full of love, and He does, he does everything He can to save us. Save us from deception. Save us from our sins. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is coming back, and He's going to take His people to be with Him in heaven. Now, He's not going to take sinners to heaven. He's going to take sinners who are saved by grace to heaven. I think some of you got scared just for a moment there. We're all sinners, right? But only some of us are sinners saved by grace. Jesus is coming back to take those to heaven who, he's, who, who they've let him save. Jesus loves everybody, but we need to let that love transform us so we're ready when he comes. Look at this. Look at what happens to those who stay behind. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and on those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Flaming fire. For those who are not ready, they're going to be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. Just a quick story here. My wife was uh, standing outside of Walmart. They had a booth set up trying to invite people to come out to a seminar. This is right before a seminar was about to happen. And uh, a gentleman came over to see the flyer that she was handing out. And as he came uh, and grabbed the flyer, uh, he said, what's this about? He said, well, it's about Bible prophecy. And uh, my computer's dead. Um, this is about Bible prophecy. And she said, well, you know, you're invited to come back. So I don't need any of this stuff because I'm not going to be here during that time. So I don't need to study prophecy. I don't need to study my Bible in that regard. And, you know, I, basically, he, you know, said goodbye and everything. It's not a positive end of that story except to say this. Friends, we need to understand that if we don't properly prepare, we will not be ready. I don't think any of us, myself included, have, an, have even an inkling of the trial to come. And we get this idea because somebody says, well, you know what? He has not appointed us unto wrath. Is that true? That's absolutely true. When Jesus Christ comes, that's the wrath of God. And we're not appointed to be destroyed by that wrath. In fact, the same wrath that destroys the sinners is the same glory that saves the righteous. The same sun that melts wax is the same sun that hardens clay. You know, what I'm you know what I'm saying? And so when Jesus returns, he's going to save the righteous and destroy the wicked. But before that happens, there's going to be a time, the Bible calls it a little time of Jacob's trouble. It's, it's a little time on earth's history in which there's going to be a great test. There, there's going to be a mark of the beast issue. There's going to be a, a, a challenge of worship. And friends, if we don't figure those things out, say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's for a group of people that need to deal with that. I'm not going to be here. Friends, we will be unprepared. And we think, oh, I'll never get the mark of the beast. Well, how do we know? If we don't even know what the mark is, or if we don't even know who the beast is. That's why it's so vital, friends, that we are willing to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. So maybe tonight, God has revealed to you that, that maybe you need to dig into this a little bit deeper. I'm not saying walk out of here saying, well, I believe everything he says. He's absolutely right. I'm just saying be willing to search, be willing to dig, be willing to examine whether or not we hold on to the truth, is what we believe helping us to prepare or helping us to be unprepared for the soon coming of Jesus? Perhaps God is asking you to examine not just your beliefs, but perhaps some kind of secret sin in your life, something that maybe you've been holding on to that would, when Jesus come back, you wouldn't be ready. Maybe that secret sin needs to be confessed. If it's secret, it probably shouldn't be confessed to everybody. We can take it to the one who we can confess to, our great God in heaven, who tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to close tonight with that one verse again. I read it earlier. I'll just read it again because it's so powerful. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9. He says, To those who eagerly wait for him, Will he appear a second time apart from sin for salvation? Are you eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back? 
If tonight you want to stand when Jesus Christ comes, I invite you to stand now as we close with prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Holy Father, there's so much confusion and teachings and doctrines about the second coming, but Lord, we do know, I think all of us here know and believe that your son is returning soon. And we want to be ready for that day. Whatever it looks like, we want to stand when the whole world falls. But we don't want to just stand alone, Lord. We want to help others stand. Help us to share this good news with others. And I pray, Father in heaven, that you would move upon our hearts, that, that if there's anything we're holding back, that you would help us to surrender it all to you. And Father, that you would help us, as, even as there's many excuses that come up and, and the devil would try to interfere with this exciting revival taking place over these next couple of weeks, Lord, that you would work in our lives and our hearts to try to make a way to be here night by night. Thank you, Father, for your precious promises that give us hope. We do say your second coming is our blessed hope, even the appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise your name now. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, God bless you all, friends. Tomorrow night, we will not be here.